Thank you for uh, everyone joining us uh, from around the country. Welcome to our new series of web episodes that keep you globally connected and explore global issues and ideas. We are so thrilled to have David Sanger with us today to talk about national security during a pandemic. Um, to set the scene, as we sit here today, around the world, we have about 425,000 people that have been tested and confirmed positive with um, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, it has spread to 168 countries with over a billion people on lockdown. Um, the World Health Organization reports that um, the United States will quickly become the epi epicenter of this virus. Um, and here to provide some clarity on what that means um, in, in terms of national and global security is David Sanger. Um, so David, uh, you know, please take it away. Thank you for having me back. It was great to be at one of your events in Hartford a few months ago, and I'm, I'm grateful to have the chance to stay in touch. And welcome uh, to my uh, completely messy attic uh, office, which maybe this uh, prolonged period of time at home will give me a moment to clean up. Um, I think we need to enter the crisis realizing that beyond the obvious health effects and our personal anxieties and fears, which are, are deep and certainly have struck my colleagues and me at the New York Times uh, very close to home yesterday with the, the death of one of our longtime uh, editors, a wonderful man named Alan Finder. Um, we need to know that the world is not going to look the same when we come out of this crisis. Uh, this will be first and foremost a medical battle, of course, and a financial battle to avoid letting the coming recession become, from becoming a global uh, depression. And you've already seen that balancing act, that tension, uh, play out as uh, President Trump has uh, talked about coming out of the uh, what the social distancing or really physical distancing um, sooner rather than later to avoid economic um, uh, uh, risks and of course others pushing back that the economic risks will only uh, be solved if you first to get past the virus. Um, but the risk is high on the economic side because all of the engines of the global economy are in simultaneous downturn. And that's what makes this so dangerous economically. Our prosperity not only depends on getting America back to business, but getting China and Europe and the rest of the world back as well. Um, but we also have to recognize that in any war, in any crisis, the relative power of nations is affected. It changes, vacuums get filled. People assess how different nations responded. People get drawn to different nations, depending on how they uh, respond. Alliances get expanded or they get strained. Now, the first and obvious issue here, of course, is China versus the United States. And there's a very healthy debate on this issue. There are some people uh, who um, believe that uh, the United States is accelerating its own withdrawal from the world at this. At the very moment when the State Department has ordered diplomats to accelerate uh, their uh, scouring of the world for medical equipment, the Chinese are beginning to ship equipment out. We heard the leader of Serbia last week say it wasn't the Europeans who were going to come in and save this country. It was going to be Xi Jinping. We haven't seen that or heard that uh, in some time. Now, there's a counter narrative that is developed as well, and that counter narrative. Uh, goes basically like this, that um, China's um, decision to withhold much of the data uh, about how things were going for so long delayed the rest of the world's ability to respond. And in so doing, uh, China has revealed itself uh, and its true character, and that as a result, um, people will be less drawn to the Chinese system. Um, it's very hard to tell how those two are going to work out as we look back on the history of this, because certainly the Chinese were not upfront about what happened. And certainly the United States responded far too slowly. That is, as I wrote in the Times today, exactly why we are looking at uh, the delivery of ventilators to hospitals in June instead of in late April. Um, but it's also true that the two countries have not been communicating. And on an issue on which you would think this would be the one moment 
for China and the United States to come back together, to begin to explore with each other common solutions, you're not seeing very much of that underway. And that leads me to my last point. You know, oftentimes, as my colleague uh, Tom Friedman points out, the news isn't in what you're hearing, it's in the silences. And here, what's not happening is, in many ways, to my mind, as important as what's happening. What's not happening right now is a coordinated global response led by the United States. When you see the president come to the podium in the White House press room, a room that he didn't spend a lot of time in prior to this time, and he makes his daily uh, report with the coronavirus task force, you hear a lot about domestic response, and that's understandable because countries have to handle their own populace and their own crises first but you don't hear very much about global response. He's made a few phone calls to world leaders. There was one conference call with the G7, which the United States is leading this year. But so far, we have not seen much of an effort to gather together all of the power of that alliance and move toward a coordinated response. And uh, that's really a fascinating uh, absence here. The silence is important. And there's a lesson, a comparison, And that is to the 2008-2009 financial crisis, also a moment where we were seeing all of the engines of the global economy slow, but we didn't have the overlay of this horrific um, global pandemic underway. And in that case, we saw the United States and China actually get into some cooperative policy. We saw the United States and Europe coordinate policy. So it takes, in a case like this, visionary leadership. And we've had that before, Lincoln during the Civil War, FDR during the Great Depression, Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. When you read about those, the responses were not uh, uh, always uh, domestic. Obviously, the Civil War was a different era and a completely uh, domestic event. But from the Great Depression forward, and certainly since the United States has been leading uh, the world in the post-World War II era. You have seen the UN as the, you've seen the United States as the great engine of global response. And so far that still could happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So I'll um, be glad to open it up to your questions now. And thanks very much. Thank you so much, David. Um, Let's for a while continue on this issue of global leadership around um, the coronavirus response. Are there examples of countries around the world that are getting it right, that are coordinating? You know, most of what we've seen so far has been individual country um, response. I think at the medical level, you're seeing a fair bit of exchange of uh, information. You know, when you look at that uh, timeline, obviously what Japan did and what South Korea did uh, were um, quite impressive in keeping the numbers down. The conditions were somewhat different. And those are countries that uh, physically are a little bit more uh, uh, contained to be able to go deal with, and of course, smaller populations. But I haven't heard our leaders say very much lately Let's go look at the South Korean and Japanese responses and see what lessons we can learn from them. And right now, our trajectory looks more like Italy and less like South Korea. That may change, but that certainly isn't what you want to see right now. So uh, late last week, you wrote a great article on the competition for vaccine development. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there? Well, we have teams in China that are looking to develop a vaccine. We have teams in the United States and now, uh, in fact, the beginning of some clinical trials, which is uh, 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 good news. Uh, And of course, we have teams in Europe. Um, There was an interesting um, uh, kerfuffle with the Germans uh, last week when uh, a number of German politicians maintained that uh, an executive of a company called CureVac, which is a German company that's working on on an um, RNA-based vaccine, um, was allegedly approached by the United States either to move their research to the U.S. or to move towards some financing or acquisition of the company. Um, The White House has been pretty silent on this. They haven't said what really happened, if anything happened. 
the only executive of the company uh, who was at a White House meeting on March 2 was an American executive uh, for this German company. He was the CEO, and he was removed a week later from his position with very little explanation. Um, the German company has said that they never received a formal offer, a formal offer from uh, the United States. I don't know exactly what that means. But the impression that this left was that the United States was trying to sort of grab the technology for itself. And this raises a big issue because every continent, every country is going to want to be racing for a vaccine. That competition can be very healthy, but you also want to have an understanding in place about how you make it available to all right away. And of course, there's a temptation always to my, do my country first. So whether the administration approaches the solution to this in an America first way or a world first way, I think will be important. Uh, so in terms of national and global security, what are some of the long-term um, impacts we could see from, um, from the coronavirus? Well, there are some positive impacts you could see. You could see more cooperation over time on vaccines and certainly on antivirals that would be a, a cure for those who've got it. Um, there are precautionary uh, elements that you could see. You know, after 9-11, we all got accustomed to different procedures at airports all around the world. And I suspect that after this event, you're going to get uh, to see very different standard practices for global health. Um, you might see, we would hope, more money for global health to solve this. You might see more cooperation globally as soon as an outbreak happens someplace. It is notable that when the Ebola uh, events happened a few years ago, the Obama administration sent 3,000 troops overseas to try to contain it to three African countries, recognizing that it could spread out. Here, our response was uh, not a whole lot to worry about, even though, as we reported last week, the Trump administration had run through Health and Human Services a very detailed simulation called Crimson Contagion last year of not exactly this kind of coronavirus, but of a, of a something more akin to an avian flu um, that spread around the world, came to the United States, and in their fictional description of it, caused um, 110 million infections, 7.7 .7 million hospitalizations, 586,000 deaths. You would have thought that we would have taken things like that and previous such simulations to look at our stockpiles of masks, of ventilators, of personal protective equipment and made sure they were up to snuff. In fact, they were not. The Obama administration ran some of those stockpiles down after the H1N1 virus, and we're having a hard time finding evidence that they restored the stockpiles as fully as they could. And the Trump administration uh, certainly did not in their first three years. So uh, there is an audience question that's a great follow-up to that. Um, so it's been reported that the State Department um, including offices usually involved in providing economic assistance to other countries have been working to obtain some medical equipment and supplies from abroad um, to address the shortage shortages that we have. Do, uh, do you have any reporting from the New York Times on how that might be changing um, the nature of negotiations with other countries? Are we looking to provide aid or benefits around, around that ability? So far, we haven't seen any evidence of that. Certainly, there are State Department officials and other American officials who are scouring the world, as I said, for um, additional supplies. Part of this rises, arises from the fact that 20 years ago, we made many of these um, here in the United States, including inexpensive things like, you know, 85 cent mass. But more than 80% of that production has been moved to China. The Chinese, understandably, in their first few months uh, of dealing with the virus themselves, um, use a lot of those uh, domestically. And only now are we seeing the exports begin to start up again. But there's a lesson in that about the import of domestic supply chains. And you know, that's a continuation of the argument we've had over 5G, the telecommunications uh, revolution taking place here and the degree to which we wanted foreign carriers, particularly Huawei, inside the U.S. network. There are some things that for a national security purpose, you want to make sure you maintain a production base for, 
uh, and we've just defined those too narrowly. Would we let other countries um, solely uh, manufacture our F-35 um, fighters? Obviously not. Well, if you consider having ventilators and masks and personal protective equipment to be part of your national security, why would you allow such a large proportion of those to be dependent on really distant supply chains? So one of the countries that's been hit very hard by um, this virus is Iran. And there have been calls from the international community to sort of ease sanctions on Iran. But we know that um, our government is doubling down on sanctions to Iran. Uh, how, what do you see the long-term impacts um, that may have on the country and its ability to develop um, nuclear, uh, a nuclear weapon? Well, the, um, the sanctions themselves, as you say, have uh, stayed on. There are some medical and humanitarian exceptions to those. The Iranians will tell you that even then it's hard to get uh, much of their gear through. Um, so far, uh, when you have seen um, foreign groups, and most recently yesterday, the Secretary General of the United Nations call for some kind of lifting of sanctions, the American response has been, we will lift sanctions on these humanitarian goods, but not on the overall issues. Um, and of course, it's the overall sanctions that are making it so hard for people to be able to make enough money to go uh, take care of their families in normal times, much less times with this kind of stress. Um, so my guess is you will see greater pressure on the United States on these. And knowing this administration, I would also speculate that you're going to see an effort by the US, if anything, to clamp down on the sanctions because their fundamental strategy is that the current Iranian government will crack. In other words, at some point, they will agree to a new, much more restrictive Iran deal, a remake of the 2015 deal, or they, their current regime will um, begin to fall apart um, under the pressure of these sanctions. So far, that is not what has happened. So far, we have not seen any evidence of that. But that is the U.S. theory, and I don't see any evidence among the people that I talk to in the administration that they plan to change their sanctions regime because of COVID-19. Last time you were here um, for the Global Security Forum, we had the pleasure of hearing about um, a, a perfect weapon, your book on, on, on cyber issues. I would, uh, can you discuss what uh, cyber vulnerabilities we might be facing in the wake of COVID? Well, I think you're going to see um, both a lot of attacks uh, continue and ex some accelerate. And I think you are going to see uh, a lot of efforts in social media and effort and so forth to grab the, the sort of narrative for social influence. So let me pick those apart. Um, the first is, uh, needless to say, given the way we're all doing this, we're seeing a lot more work at home. And that work at home includes the U.S. government, includes the Defense Department, includes the intelligence agencies, and so forth. That increases the attack surface for the Russians, the Iranians, the North Koreans, anybody else who was looking to get into U.S. systems. It also increases the attack surface for companies because so many of um, their employees are working from home, presumably from less secure systems than they would in the office. So that's on the attack side. We've seen some step up, but we haven't seen anything serious. It may be a little bit too early for that. On the narrative side of this, it's important to separate out how the Russians and the Chinese differ. The Chinese are using this moment to basically use social media to play out their narrative that China overcame the virus and now is a generous leader to the rest of the world in showing it how to do the same. In other words, to build themselves up is a global leader. And you've seen that quite aggressively on Twitter, on other social media, and you've seen a lot of shout downs of people who said, but wait a minute, what might you have done differently to warn the world at the time that this was first in breakout uh, at the beginning of the year? Um, the Russians, on the other hand, use the moment to undercut confidence in other governments, particularly the United States. So there you've seen a rise in messaging that basically says, don't trust what the government says, repeating various, you know, uh, 
bizarre scenarios that this was an American planted um, uh, bioweapon. Obviously, it was not. Um, so uh, you're seeing the Russians and the Chinese sort of play the tight right now. Um, so with those scenarios, is there sort of, can you give us an example of what would be sort of your worst case scenario here um, in the cyber domain? The worst case scenario in the cyber domain is that the United States um, uh, is under both a hacking attack on vital systems that are now more spread out and somehow loses that battle of the narrative. And so, you know, it's important now more than ever to be able to be aware of what you're reading, think about the sources of it, ask yourself how a story got there, ask yourself what evidence there is of it. And that's a hard thing to do because what we're basically trying to do and have been trying to do since 2016, since the, uh, what we've discovered happened in the election, is make people message and news literate in a way that they haven't been before. That the words, I read it on the internet, should be banned from the language, that you need to know exactly what the sourcing is and what the evidence is. Um, that's been made more difficult, quite frankly, by a government that tries to take legitimate news agencies and call them fake news. And you've seen the Chinese pick up on that in their decision to expel uh, American reporters from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post from uh, China just at the moment when an examination of what China did right and what it did wrong is more important than ever. Um, so that's, that's one big effect. Um, but I think that we're also going to have to think ahead to the election. Um, it's perfectly reasonable to assume that Americans may be cautious about lining up on tight end lines, stepping into school gymnasiums, touching the same touch screen that had been touched by a hundred people or a thousand people or two thousand people before them to conduct an election. And my guess is you're going to see a lot more discussion of moving to the kind of mail-in ballots that we're using in five states, including Washington state. Um, so to sort of follow up, we do have a question um, from someone in the audience who sort of uh, asked a question about this culture war, um, you know, the U.S. sort of administration using the words Chinese virus and, you know, some people in China sort of blaming the U.S. Um, and so uh, Jackson wants to know what can be done to mitigate the harm of fake news spread in China in the, um, in the foreign ministry. Will this pandemic harm the reputation of the United Nations, the World Health Organization, because of the um, acceptance and in the, the inaccurate reporting? Um, or, or this culture war that's been started? Well, the, the disinformation is a big issue. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a strong believer that, you know, the first way you combat disinformation is with accurate information. You know, uh, my favorite phrase is, the first thing to know about fake news is it isn't news, right? Um, uh, but the second thing is that uh, I think you're going to see more pressure than ever on Facebook, on Twitter, and others to weed out what is obvious disinformation, particularly from abroad. This is the moment for big tech to redeem itself in a way that uh, it hasn't since the 2016 election. And you may well see that this is their moment to do so. Uh, there's also some risk here. I mean, Big tech is, I think, more likely to emerge as the winner out of this uh, in economic terms than um, smaller technology companies. Um, Facebook is just having trouble keeping the lights on. There is just so much use right now. Um, groups like Zoom, which I think we're using right now for this meeting, are among the few stocks that have risen while the rest of the market has melted down. Um, you are uh, seeing a, a lot more pressure on other social media groups. But this time we're going into it armed with the knowledge of what happened in 2016. And I think the real test is how good the social media companies, which in 2016 did not think it was their, their role to filter or edit content, to begin to think about taking out the worst of that content. So um, in terms of the, the U.S., you know, getting new equipment, new ventilators from China, um, someone in the audience wants to know, do you see any cyber vulnerabilities there? Any, um, 
any issues with accepting medical equipment from China at this point? You know, at this point, most of the medical equipment that we are accepting from China that we need the most are not of a digital nature. It's masks, it's personal protective devices. That's where we moved much of our manufacturing. I've spoken just in the past day to some of the manufacturers here in the United States for the heavy-duty electronic uh, elements of this, um, like Medtronic, uh, which is in Minneapolis. Uh, you've seen GM decide that it's going to team up with GE Healthcare to try to make um, uh, ventilators and so forth. But there are supply chain issues. Uh, in talking to Medtronic yesterday, uh, they're turning out about 225 um, ventilators a week at their uh, factory of high-end ventilators. But uh, to do so requires 1,500 unique parts spread over 14 countries. So that gives you a sense of our reliance on supply chain. And as I said, just as there are military, uh, military equipment that we wouldn't think of being reliant on abroad, I think we're going to begin to think that way about our healthcare uh, equipment as well. But yeah. for this point, at this point, we don't have a choice. I mean, you have to, you have to go to war with the supply chain you have to, to misquote Don Rumsfeld. <laughs> so, um, so longer term impacts on um, trade relations and the global supply chain. Do you see sort of a new world emerging after this crisis? Uh, I think you do. I think you're going to see, in some ways, a reinforcement of some nationalistic tendencies, that there's some things we're not going to be dependent on. That doesn't mean you need to be 100% dependent on domestic production, but it means that you have to fill your stockpiles for truly worst-case scenarios, and you have to have a big domestic base up and running and alive. You know, in World War II, when we um, began producing battleships, we made a whole lot more in the United States. And so, you know, the discovery here now that we don't have the kind of production facilities that we do just tells you there's been bad planning. And in our way, it's not bad planning. I should correct myself. It's bad execution because the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and the Trump administration all ran scenarios that warned of these dangers. So uh, someone in the audience also wants to know, um, you know, it's been reported that the current administration really did cut um, its, its uh, pandemic staff from the National Security Council. Do we think, do you think we're going to permanently learn these lessons now? Well, the administration will tell you that they didn't cut it. They will tell you that they merged it with the WMD office, right? So we had a separate sort of world pandemic office that was set up after the H1N1 and Ebola uh, experiences by the Obama administration. It wasn't really made formal until the fall of 2016. So it only had a, a few months formally in office, although uh, it had been used uh, prior to that. Um, then the Trump administration came in and merged that in, with the WMD office. What's the problem with that? Well, look, a lot of offices get merged. There's a lot of ways to dismiss something as a, as a our reorganization corporations do that for efficiency all the time. I would argue that within the NSC, um, it makes a big difference whether you have a separate pandemic office that is focused on global health, or you have a group that is faced largely with the question of bioweapons, nuclear weapons, and so forth. The WMD office at the NSC does vital work but they think in proliferation and military terms. They worry about a bioweapon coming in from Russia. They don't, because of that orientation, think as much uh, as one former member of the Obama administration, Ron Klain, uh, put it the other day. They don't tend to think as much about the bioweapon that comes in from teenagers who've been on spring break. And that requires a very different kind of mindset. And uh, I think that was at the core of the mistake in merging those two offices. So um, as our time here is coming to a close, uh, what final thoughts do you have for our, our audience as we go through the next weeks and months? Well, I think, you know, the first issue we'll all be um, consumed with is our personal health and following those guidelines and 
dealing with the cabin fever that um, uh, that uh, comes from that. I'm sympathetic to it. I've had the uh, return of, of post-college children to uh, to our house. On the one hand, it's wonderful to have family dinners again, and on the other hand, uh, you know, everybody's sort of cooped up, uh, you know, wanting to get out and do their thing. And that that temptation will be, I think, even greater as the weather gets better and we wonder how long this has to go on. The second thing on a policy level that I think will be consumed by is this tension between the president's desire to just get business going again and the warning that in uh, the economics of pandemics, you have to solve the health problem first or suddenly we're in this cycle again and you're back worse than you were before and you've killed off a lot more people in the interim. And that's going to be, I think, a tension you're going to see play out. The third big one, though, is to what degree does this accelerate the isolation of the United States that we've seen over the past three years? When we look at the arc of the Trump uh, presidency, are we going to say that we saw things that were lining up to this moment that none of us could have anticipated involving um, the depth of this pandemic. I didn't say that we couldn't have anticipated the pandemic. That was, in fact, anticipated. But the thinking about the global ramifications for it. And I think it's going to take us a year or two just to see those play out. And it will probably take us many years to go figure out what it was that we did wrong. You know. It was years after World War II was over that we came to reassess the question of the internment of Japanese Americans, which today seems completely unconscionable and at the time to the country seemed to make sense. Uh, it's taken us decades and to still debate whether dropping the atomic bomb was the right thing. And it took years after World War II for the current global order to, to sort of reshape. And I think it's going to take years after this for the global order to shape in reaction to it. David Sanger, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us today and for being such a great friend to the World Affairs Councils, not only ours, but all of the ones around the country. Um, uh, thank you all to our audience for joining us. Um, and I hope you'll join us again. I hope everyone stays safe and well. Thank you.